them feel unseen, they don't understand the process, and it creates this sense of distrust between the community and the court. I didn't realize that I was practicing procedural justice. I just went into court and decided that I was going to treat everyone like the human beings that they were. I understood that if we saw people as individual cases that were unique, not only could I resolve that case, but I could also increase the chances that they wouldn't come back with another case. People felt that they were heard, that they were treated fairly, with dignity and respect by the justice system. They began to trust the system, and then they were willing to allow you to help them. When I first came into your courtroom, you, you were different. You, you asked me how, how I was doing. You explained everything as far as what was going on with my case. I felt like I was, I was being helped. People who end up in the criminal justice system, they almost grow accustomed to going to jail because they know they don't have money to pay bail. So if a homeless person gets a ticket for sleeping outside, which we know they can't pay, it puts them in this cycle of arrest for non-payment, arrest for not showing up to court. That one person can go to jail multiple times on one case. So it's this idea that we keep people in this cycle of incarceration. I thought that I was going to be going to jail. When I got enrolled into the program at community service, and then two days where I had to go meet with, with a social worker, she helped me get back into school. I was fortunate enough that we had a community court that would allow alternative sentencing. This meant that a person who would otherwise get jail now received community service, counseling sessions, mental health services. And so partnering this assistance piece with punishment of community service, where they were actually paying back in the community that they harmed, changed the delivery of justice. You're addressing the underlying reasons why they offend, therefore taking them out of this cycle of incarceration. You made me write an essay on how good and bad choices could affect your life. I remember reading this essay in the courtroom and then at the end, hearing everybody clap. It, it, it felt like, I'm, I don't even know if words can, can, can explain this. I would sometimes tell defendants, I'm so proud of you. And when they would say, Judge, I'm proud of myself, I thought, wow, what a new emotion, what a new experience to feel pride in yourself. I saw them as they should be, and now they see themselves. And when they see themselves, it changes everything. Wow, that's a, that's a more than impressive. Um, <laughs> Judge Pratt, I'm so proud of you. Oh. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you How? so much for having me, for um, sharing your audience with me, for giving me an opportunity to just talk. Well, no, it sounds like you give a lot of opportunities. You've been given a lot of opportunities. And um, it's amazing because I've, I've, I've had a chance to hang out with you, you know, through communication, through the day. Um, our good friend, Ryan Haygood, he put us together. Yeah. And you're here in, in the city and like you're a retired judge. Mm -hmm. You're that black girl magic we've been hearing about. I love it. No, you are. In, in person. <laughs> you're that black girl magic <laughs> in person. And you got like, I'm not going to talk about your wonderful colleagues because it might be my, like me guilt by association. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but really, um, Judge Pratt, I'm just um, so much I want to talk to you about because you've served time on the bench. Mm -hmm. Folks are coming in front of you. You're from or you're you're in Newark, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. It's kind of black there, isn't it? Yeah, really. <laughs> it's kind of different. Yeah, there's a kinda, there's a the brick city is that. <laughs> well, well, like with that. No, let me pull up. Like, I want to go to your bio and everybody that's following along. I'm just going to I'm going to just tell you a little bit about who we have the pleasure of being with this evening. Judge Victoria Pratt. She probably wouldn't tell you any of this stuff. She'd be like, you know, I'm just kind of, you know, I'm just doing my thing, you know. But listen, um, driven, 
innovative, inspiring. These are just a few of the words to describe Judge Victoria Platt. Pratt, who has gained national and international acclaim for her commitment to reforming the criminal justice system. That's what you're doing? That's what I'm doing. That is what God has called me to do. Is loud in my ear every time I doubt that this is what one person can do to change systems, to get people thinking differently about the delivery of justice, about the humanity of the people who come through our criminal justice system, about how minor contacts with the criminal justice system creates major derailments in people's lives, how our insatiable desire for punishment is driving and keeping people in poverty devastating families and how we can change that. No, you said an insatiable desire for what? Punishment. We have as a justice system, as a country, this desire to just continue to punish and punish and punish. And we're never satisfied with the amount of punishment, irrespective of what the underlying offense is. We want to act like everyone has committed mass murder and a person who, you know, pleads guilty to a low offending crime because they don't, they can't pay. They couldn't pay when we impose the fine. We want to punish them as if you can get water from a rock. <laughs> well, like I can tell you what you're saying could be a little triggering to, for some. <laughs> but So hit them with the trigger alert. Trigger alert. This is a show that triggers people because you've entered a free think zone. If you are not willing to be exposed to other points of view, tune out now and don't read the comments. You have been warned. You've been warned. And here we are uh, in the free think zone. It's a it's a big special day because I've got lots of questions. But first, I understand that your father was came up. It was Harlem, Manhattan janitor. So my, I am the daughter of an African-American garbage garbage man who was born obviously in Harlem Hospital but spent his summers in the segregated South. My father never felt like he had the full rights of citizenship, not even after they signed the Civil Rights Act. And then your 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 mother's from the islands. Mi mamá es una pelu mi mamá. Mi mamá es una peluquera dominicana. Um, mm -hmm. Pequito. <laughs> My mother, clearly you only say salsa. <laughs> My mother, uh, I'm the daughter of a Dominican beautician who came to this country for a better life for her unborn children. Now, but here's what I really want to like dig into. Um, how did you arrive in the field of law? Like what was what was it as, you know, here's this this young chocolate gumdrop. Oh, wow. You know what I mean? And it's navigating <laughs> this world. And then some, something along the way said, you know what? I want to get into law. I want to get into that. And someone kind of pushed you or nudged you in that direction. So when I was a young person, I always was committed to changing the world. I was like, I got to change the world because the world doesn't treat people who look like me, who sounds like me with fairness. Doesn't happen for us. And... Initially, I was really hesitant about going to law school. I didn't think I was smart enough. And I didn't initially get in. I couldn't believe it. Like, did you not read my application properly? And I started working at a women's center. The, um, it was the largest Hispanic community center in the state of New Jersey. And I started teaching English as a second language to women who were on the welfare to work program. And I really began to understand how policies impact poor people. You're experiencing poverty, you're seeing it, but to understand how policies impact po poor people. And then in the afternoon, I taught dance to their children. And I was still shocked that there were families that the kids were hungry and I was in America. And so I realized that I wasn't going to be able to change the world just sitting in this classroom teaching and, and God bless teachers, but that I had to do something else. So I reapplied to law school and ended up going to Rutgers Law School, which is known as the Electric Law School. I will tell you that what's important about Rutgers Law School is that it was after the rebellions in Newark that people went to the law school and chained themselves. And they actually said, we want people who look like us in this building. And so there's this thing that I talk about 
um, I drink deeply, and it's biblical, mm -hmm. I drink deeply from a well that I did not dig. And there were paths cleared for me by people who didn't even know I was coming. So just looking at law school and looking at Newark, that the folks who were clearing this path for black folks to get into the law school, i.e. the minority student program was created. It was really about that. And how do you pay that back? How do you pay that forward when people make sacrifices for you that they themselves are not going to benefit from? And so I go to law school and it's this place that's really grounded in community service. You know, I have a mother, I had a mother who spent her time using hair as her missionary work, mm -hmm. you know, and using her beauty salon as a space where she cared for the defendants who came before me, you know, I would be on the bench when I became a judge and people would come out and they're like, ain't you Miss Elsie's daughter? And I'd have to say, oh my God, get them out of here, it's a conflict. But this idea that there was this community of people that I had grown up with, that I had grown to see and watch my mother care for. And you know, we're always like, oh, I'm not gonna become my parent. Well, that's exactly who I became. I, it was seeing the humanity in Tyrone who was HIV positive mm. and called my mother Ma and my mother would go, not just him and bring, I'm gonna get going with those boxes of cereal. Oh, he likes sugar snaps, so I'm gonna bring those. And that she felt a commitment to them. And I was always impressed by, my mother could stand on the steps of her beauty salon and scream at two drug addicts, throw men fighting, and say, you know, you're not supposed to do that. And they'd stop. You're right, Ma, I'm so sorry. And they'd be ashamed that they would have embarrassed her or had to make her. So for me, like, she on a, almost on a micro level, was doing this transformative community work by just being herself. And so then here I have this opportunity to go into the world and do something. I had an opportunity to have an education in a way she hadn't. She and my father, they, my father had an eighth grade education. She had one and then she got a GED in this country. And so you're always thinking about how do I do more? How do I really not make a mark, but how do I serve? Because I can see clearly what the issue is. And so folks come into court and you're looking at them and I now, uh, you know, storytelling is the, the stories that we tell ourselves, that we hear people tell about us. And so I do this procedural justice thing. I, I believe that what happens when you see people and you hear them and you start listening to them tell you stories about who they are and you know it's a lie. Hmm. Right. You know that you are more than that. You know that the person who said this harmful thing to you had it said to them and nobody corrected it. So let's stop this legacy of um, falsehood. Like, you know, when you tell a child you ain't never going to amount to anything, that's a stupid thing to say to hmm. them. You're not in control of their destiny. But the lie ends up controlling their destiny. You see how I'm staring at you? Do you get a lot of those stares? I like, do. Like, you're a really... judge, like, you're black, and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> folks are like... <laughs> yeah, I get a like, lot of stares. Like, really, like, I mean, it's... I was just telling somebody that I initially didn't know how to read an audience. I would just do my thing, and when they ended, you're like, well, as long as I got the floor, you got to listen whether you like it or not. Interestingly enough, I've, been do I've done international work, and I went to Dubai, and I was walking around and I was like, good morning, good morning, good morning. And the male judges wouldn't speak to me. They would look at me and they would look away. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. They'd look at me and they'd look away. And I actually asked them when it was I offending them culturally. And they were like, oh, no, they're pretty cool. And I was like, oh, just because, but not if you were a chick. Mm -hmm. So I said, that's okay, because when I get on the stage, you have to look and listen to me. And I get on the stage and I'm talking about this human-centered justice, how we have to do these things. And I start noticing through the translation that the judges are shaking their head in agreement and they're laughing. And I always do like a translation check and I say, in the States, I'm really funny, so this translation better be going right. Now if people laugh, it's going mm -hmm. good. But at the end of my talk, the judges started talking to me and smiling and People were like, you're right, we really have to remember, return to this piece of humanity. Hmm. And just so I laugh because that look I got too, and I just ignore it because all I'm here to do is share a message 
and my message, you're going to hear it, whether you want to hear it or not. So yes, you are looking at me strange. I'm but, not really but, sure why. But you know, but you got to you got to you got to interpret them looks. You know what I mean? And as as a judge, uh-huh. like you judges, you're the coolest. I mean, you you do some some amazing stuff. You tell uh-huh. people things that somebody should have told somebody a long time ago. Yeah. Like hopefully. if you ever sit by a like. People, they really do listen to judges because they have to. They have to. So what (laughs) happens if the judge decides to use this as an opportunity to heal and uplift and not denigrate and harm? Exactly. And so when I'm looking at you, like you've got you're interpreting those looks like every these first impressions and like in your courtroom, I'm sure you see some people over and over, some you see for the first Mm -hmm. time. But you get this sixth sense of like, okay, what's what's about to come my way? I Mm -hmm. see a lot of a lot of different things but when i'm looking at you it's not it's it's from a sense of incredible pride oh, you know what i mean God. it's like <laughs> okay and then you got young black girls and others that are looking at you yes. as like man okay that that's mm-hmm. where i can be also mm-hmm. and then you've got others that look at you like what are you doing here yeah. you know and then but our first look as the blacks you know we all sniff each other out first we're like is this is she black <laughs> <laughs> like no nah, i mean like black like is she like did, black, didn't white folks black. just put her there to lock up all the blacks you know what i mean and it's like and then you're like you start talking no, you're like no reality. this is a sister this is like somebody who hasn't forgotten where she's come from and then represents like in fairness mm-hmm. you know what i mean and with under Understanding, I think that's the level of humanity yes. that you bring to the bench. And you have this term that you brought up a couple of times, procedural justice. What is that? Well, when I teach procedural justice, I just want to go back to this piece that you mentioned about judges, how people perceive them. If people don't perceive you as a part of that community, it's hard for them to respect what you're saying. So for me, even if I'm looking at a police report, I know what the community looks like. So if you tell me this thing is happening, I'm like, nah, that now nah, that can't happen there because I know what that neighborhood looks like. Or when I'm coming to work and I see one of a guy on a street and I know it's pill heaven. When he comes to court, I'm like, I saw you on Bradford Place and I don't want to see you there again because I know what's happening there. People are like, oh my gosh, when I go to the best chicken spot, in the community, I can tell you why I want this community to be safe because I use it. It is my space as well. That's the problem that I'm hearing right now. That's it. About the un- you ain't left the hood. Ah! <laughs> but, <laughs> but, like most of ours, leave the hood. You know, ain't nobody no Bradford Place. You're, you don't come but, up. You're supposed but, to. You don't eat chicken. But you don't like, have you to don't even do that. still live in the hood to but know, know that, it. But know it. You have yeah. to know the communities that you serve. I mean, we were talking to two judges, and they're talking about they know the high school, they know the people who live there, and I'm like. That makes you a legitimate authority. Mm. Now I can go into procedural justice because procedural justice is this concept that says if people believe, if they perceive that they're treated with dignity and respect and fairly by the justice system, that includes police officers, the people, and particularly the judges, not only does it increase trust in the justice system, but it reduces crime because people begin to obey the law. People don't obey the law because they were afraid of the consequence. They obey the law because they see the people imposing the law as legitimate authorities to impose rules and regulations that they have to live by. And Tom Tyler from a professor at Howard did this did this research starting back in the 70s. There's even current research that shows that when they looked at people who were in drug treatment programs and they compared them to people who went through traditional programs, the first thing that the people who were in the drug treatment, the drug court program said, one of the reasons they got clean because of their relationships with the judge. When the judge was respectful, when the judge saw them, when the judge did those things, they felt that they were connected. There was a rapport that made them believe that I can now listen, I should listen to this person because not only do they care about me, but they are a legitimate authority that's willing to help me in this process. And so there are four principles. Um, People have to have an opportunity to be heard, which is difficult, which is unusual for people who are black, brown, for marginalized and poor. People don't listen to these folks. They come into communities and say, this is what you need to save yourselves. And nobody asks you, 
how, wh- what is it that I need to do to help you in this space? Mm-hmm. No one spends any time doing that. The process has to be neutral and people have to be constantly thinking about neutrality. How are you engaged? How does it appear? Does it look like the police officer runs the courtroom? Does it look like you only listen to the police also? Mm-hmm. You know, um, then there's understand. People have to understand the process. So many people who are in the criminal justice system are, the, are the, we all know that it's only a small portion of the population that's involved in the criminal justice mm-hmm. system. It's a small portion of the entire community. They Unfortunately, though, they are repeatedly in the system. And sometimes the criminal justice system moves them from small time offending and actually stuff that shouldn't even be criminalized into larger and more um, challenging offenses. And so- I mean, and like, like it's amazing what 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 you're saying. I want I'm I'm thinking, and we're with we're with Judge Pratt. She's you're retired. Yes. And now you're well, not retired, old. Just retired. yeah. You're, you you, uh, you she, just- she's she's the been there, done that type retired. Yeah, thank now she's mm-hmm. she, you're 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 <laughs> teaching in the very place that you went to school so for I'm law. I'm no longer teaching. I am now the executive director of an organization called M- Odyssey Impact, and they wow. we use storytelling and documentaries and faith and secular voices to galvanize people into action against social injustice. What about the like when we say just us system? You hear that a lot. When you get there, you get to the court, it's like it's just us. Like and that's actually not what I hear. I hear some other stuff. <laughs> yeah, well I know I know no, I know you hear some some doozy of stuff, but Here's what I like as much as we are as a people. And I'm just wondering if this is a class situation. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? A lack of access situation, um, resources, expectations and all that. But when we go to any courthouse USA, if I go in there, I'm going to see a lot of black and brown Mm -hmm. bodies on one side of the courtroom. And then I'm going to see a few people that might look like us on the other side. Mm -hmm. And it would seem like as much as we're in this system, we should be dominating this system in terms of the other side, in terms of the judges, in terms of the attorneys, Mm -hmm. in terms of the understanding of it, because we're there so much. Well, I mean, it did. There's so many ways that you can begin to fill in that space, right? Because what is this is why the vote is so important. Mm. This is why when people are like, what can we do? We can do a lot of things. But when we don't vote, we don't understand how much of our power we give away. We have got to hold our elected officials accountable. If you want a court that is compassionate, that is of service to your community, you have to have judges, you have to have DAs, you have to have prosecutors who are appointed by the body that you elect put in those places. You have to move out all the folks who are not doing what you want of them. The problem is that we let politicians make all these promises. We get them elected, particularly black women voters, because we show up to vote. Mm -hmm. And then they get into the office and we don't force them to do any of the stuff that, that we've told them to do. If you want to see black women on the bench, when you get elected, when they get elected, you need to still be meeting with these people mm-hmm. and making sure. And there's something called a recall. I'm not mm-hmm. telling y'all to recall people, but I'm just telling you that that is a real threat for people. If if governance has to be what you say you wanted and you can't sit back and wait for somebody else to do it, you have to be planning before you get into this office. This is what we want. We want these folks in office because they're good people and we've selected them. Um, unfortunately, too often we get people elected and the only people who get appointed are the folks from their um, special interest groups, right? Who hmm. gave the most money. But the people who give the money don't get to pull a switch and give you a vote. And you look at um, their places, unfortunately, like my city, we have like 200,000 voters. And a mayor can get elected with less than 30,000 votes. Wow. 20,000 votes. You have registered voters. And so. What does that mean? That means that nobody's cared enough to come out and vote. And so there's only a small portion of the population that's making decisions about who gets to be in office. And so it's that kind of apathy. The numbers are there. So many people who are successful in elections are folks who get the folks who are sleeping. Mm hmm reactivated. But I'm just saying that these communities, you have to continue. You want to police 
uh, director who believes in reform, who believes officers should be peace officers, when you your mayor elects him, appoints him, that mayor better be appointing somebody you are in agreements agreement with. That's being actively and understanding the political process. You got a book. Can you tell me what the Ooh, name of that book is? Because you done is, wrote that book. What is I that? I wrote this book. It's called The Power of Dignity: How Transforming Justice Can Heal Our Communities. What's dignity? Ah, dignity is your humanity. Dignity mm. is respect. Dignity is how you walk into a place. And so often, so few of our folks have it when they come in. But the criminal justice system makes a great effort to ensure that you don't have it. I, I like to folks say, oh, you know, that book, that's hokey. This idea of <laughs> dignity is kumbaya. People don't care about dignity in the criminal justice system, and that's a lie. And we care so much about dignity in the criminal justice system that it's the first thing that we strip people of. Our processes, how you don't understand what's happening, how we treat you when you come into a courthouse, how we stop you, is the first thing we do is to try to strip you of your dignity. How we house you in prisons and jail is undignified is so that you really understand that now that you're in this process, you are less than. That's how important dignity is. Dignity is a major part of the punishment. It's a major part and it's unnecessary because people, the, there's a book by Malcolm Ely called The Process is the Punishment. So mm. literally having to come and have your case heard becomes the punishment itself. Now I'm going to tell you I'm here because Denver has really been on the the, the, the front of this, trying to get their judges. You said Denver has been in the front of this? Denver, I have been to Denver maybe five times talking about this and getting in front of judges. And I'm just here today. Yeah, I mean, we've got four judges here uh, of color. <laughs> I'm not saying who. I, and, and, and a couple of judges have come out of Brother Jeff's Cultural Center as poets and, and performers and have yes. been integral parts of the community. And, um, when you become a judge, do you have to separate yourself from society? Oh, you like, do. do you have to have like this, like, yes. I, and do you have to have this kind of, I don't know, attitude like this, kind well, of, oh, got an opinion on that? There's this idea, and, and I think I write about it sometimes, wow, so I forget about how much stuff I wrote, about this distance and detachment, and this idea that judges need to be distanced and detached to be able to be neutral and it's wrong because it's that it's in that distance that the judge can't understand how a community has changed, can't understand what's happening in the community. And being detached doesn't help them do their job well either. And so um, and then the judges get penalized for it. They get penalized for um, there was this case in New Jersey where judges had belonged to a church group. It was a Catholic church and they would have dinner before they would have their Friday mass. And one of the people in the group, in the congregation, it wasn't just the judges, it was just people who belonged to this Catholic church, got charged with some kind of political fraud. He got charged, hadn't pled guilty, hadn't gone to trial, and he kept going to his dinners. Well, he better be in church right. if he's got this pending charge. And someone reported the judges to the ethics committee, and they said that the judges had been in violation of ethics because they kept, they were around this person who had been charged. Now they have to stop worshiping hmm. as a result. Like it was, it was so over the top and so ridiculous because the judges still have a right to be people and to be yeah. to worship. So this, this. This this weird thing that happens that you become you're a part of this community oftentimes before you become a judge so which is why you know so much the good judges anyway and then they get on the bench you can't be photographed with politicians so now I'm like I gotta jump out this picture this selfie if the if he photo bombs like and and it just becomes worrisome to the so sometimes the judges just stay home well um, and, and and with <laughs> that being said it's real interesting that you talked about Denver being perhaps at the forefront or very interesting 
interested in yeah. or investing in. You've been here three or four four times. We've got several judges here, mm-hmm. and you went to speak to judges. What is it that you would tell, or what was it that you're sharing, and what would you talk about to judges as it relates well, to this procedural justice, this yes. humanity, this dignity, et cetera? What so are you I telling tra- them? I talk to judges across the country who are interested in it, but it's the same thing, these principles, how we can be more compassionate, how we can do things that allow us to deliver justice in a way that really serves our community. Um, And people are so receptive and turned on by it. How, you know, the last principle is respect and respect is good morning and good afternoon. And I was telling them that I, the first time I talked about that, a judge came up to me and said, ah, you call the defendants, sir and ma'am. And I said to them, you know, if I'm discourteous to somebody, that doesn't say anything about them. It says something about me. And so this idea that you get to bring your full self, I bring, I'm Miss Elsa's daughter, all that shows up when I'm on the bench because I'm a full person. And so often we take out that part of us that's intuitive about a situation when we're on the bench. Um, We make presumptions about people because of things that we've heard. Uh, we don't hold people to task. We officers, this, this. I'm not going to impute facts for you. This sounds like garbage. If it's garbage, it's getting dismissed. Mm. Madam Prosecutor, it's not my job to make your job easier. Mr. Public Defender, have you spoken to your client? If you can't tell me these things about your client, I'm not accepting this plea because clearly it's not knowing. I can't say that it's knowing and that they understand or that it's even voluntary. So taking time to talk to people, defendants, and and to really just kind of figure out some of the things that are going on. I always treated my courtroom like my living room. So if you Hmm. were sitting in there, the judge was going to talk to you. So sometimes a defendant came and it was I'm like, uncle, come on up here. Let's see why you're here with them. Like, right. Because that uncle has come with that nephew or niece. And it's important to understand that relationship. Um, A parent may come and they just got out of jail. So one of the things that I noticed a lot, men get out of prison or jail and grandma's taking care of the kid and grandma's not going to really release that kid to daddy until you know daddy's got an opportunity to get some of his stuff together when women get out of prison people are like here's your baby figure Mm. it out and so how is she supposed to do that how is she supposed to do that when she's you know suffering the same circumstances and inability to work may not be able to get government assistance and so being able to understand those things culturally as well. I mean, there's a reason why we need to understand the people we serve. Uh, we need to understand mental illness. We really need to understand whether the person's responding because they're being disorderly, disrespectful, or it's the voices in their head. Well, you've got a you've got a TED talk. I think there's like a million folks that have watched this TED talk. Yes, like and you've the gone clip viral. Has Thirty-seven. The clip on Facebook has thirty-seven million. Can I put on a piece of it? Yes, I want to because I want because there's some pieces <laughs> that you say inside of your TED talk, and I just want to kind of go go to a little of it. Judge. I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. I've been watching you and you're not two-faced. You treat everybody the same. That was said to me by a transgender prostitute who before I had gotten on the bench had fired a public defender, insulted the court officer and yelled at the person sitting next to her. I don't know what you're looking at. I look better than the girl you're with. (laughs) She said this to me after I said her male name low enough so that it could be picked up by the record. But I said her female name loud enough so that she could walk down the aisle towards counsel's table with dignity. This is procedural justice, also known as procedural fairness at its best. You see, I am the daughter of an African-American garbage man who was born in Harlem and spent his summers in the segregated South. Soy la hija de una peluquera dominicana. I do that to make sure you're still paying attention. (laughs) I'm the daughter of a Dominican beautician who came to this country for a better life for her unborn children. My parents taught me you treat everyone you meet with dignity and respect, no matter how they look, no matter how they dress, no matter how they spoke. You see, the principles of fairness were taught to me at an early age. 
And unbeknownst to me, it would be the most important lesson that I carried with me to the Newark Municipal Court bench. And because I was dragged off the playground at the early age of 10 to translate for family members as they be began to migrate to the United States, I understand how daunting it can be for a person and novice to navigate any government system. Every day across America and around the globe, people encounter our courts. And it is, is a place that is foreign, intimidating, and often hostile towards them. They are confused about the nature of their charges, annoyed about their encounters with the police, and facing consequences that might impact their relationships, their finances, and even their liberty. Let me paint a well, I guess we painted that picture. <laughs> but over a million people have seen you via that TED Talk. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a theme that continues to run through it, dignity. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about values that I think most decent people mm -hmm. hold dear, you know. But you're, you're talking about how individuals come into a system that tends to be hostile, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, punitive, um, and hard to navigate, particularly if you don't have the resources to navigate mm -hmm. it. And you are working to turn some of that around. How do you do that without folks saying, well, you're a judge, you're not a social worker? Oh, I do it and they say it anyway. I don't care. <laughs> That's your business if you're going to get caught up in social work. What I'm talking about is access to justice. People having the right hmm. to understand what is happening, the right to speak, the right to defend their cases. They have a right to do all these things. And we sometimes forget and we forget that people have pled not guilty. We forget that they've pled not guilty. And then even after they are found guilty, we still don't have the right to mistreat them. Like nowhere in the Constitution says now you get to give them a sentence and mistreat them as well. So what I'm asking people to do is think about, we, we talked about, it's interesting that you said that thing about values, because I was once asked by someone, what would you say to your critics who say that um, you are treating, you are trying, you are teaching or imposing upper middle class values on poor people. And I thought that was hmm. funny because when the person thought I was upper middle class growing up, right? But that the person, and so I smiled and I said, if you poor people, um, if you ask poor people, they would tell you that they got more values than rich people because in their families and communities, if they eat, everybody eats, hmm. right? This idea that when you are poor, you survive because the other poor people around you ensure that you have. And so this idea that these values, that values of dignity and respect, um, that the rich, you know, have a monopoly on them is false. We already know. I mean, people say, oh, judge, you know, you hang out with gangsters. And I'm like. I hang out with gangsters because I go to Pelican Bay prison to work with folks. I hang out with gangsters. I never met a gangster until I went to work in government and started working with men who wore suits and would wipe out an entire community with a pen. Entire wow. communities get wiped out with eminent domain. Well, just think about this. You in, in your TED talk, you have some examples of how to communicate with individuals via the question, like, for example, medication or mental health. And yeah. you reframe different questions. Um, talk about some of those that stand out and relationships that you've developed in the courtroom. So speaking to people who have mental health issues and trying to identify whether they're on medication and why you might be getting information that's not um, full, why it might not be the entire story, why a person's behavior might not be, um, why it might look disruptive, but it's really something else, why a person might be bipolar in particular. And, and a person who might be bipolar, who is having, is decompensating or having an issue, 
most likely can get, will most likely be arrested. In most communities, they can get arrested. They're yelling, you know, being disorderly is causing alarm. So they show up in court because they had an issue. They had an episode. And instead of taking a person with mental illness to the hospital, they get sent to the courthouse. Police officers will tell you, I can't sit on that person at the hospital. And they end up getting sent to the courthouse or arrested. So they spend a night in jail and then they come before a judge and they still haven't gotten their medication. Wow. So I knew that um, I, we had a a program called Newark Community Solutions. And I knew this was working and really permeating the community when we had an officer call one of our social workers. It's our, it was our ability to impose um, punishment with assistance. So instead of going to jail, a drug addict would have an opportunity to do social services at the courthouse, therapy, and then do community service, where they, which means that they pay back what they owe for their behavior. But I once we once got a call, the social worker got a call from a police officer saying, I got a guy here and I need you to give me his um, emergency contact. And he was like, how do you know I have that? Well, he's got this green envelope, which means that he's in your program and he's having a hard way. If you give me his mother's number or his emergency contact, I'll take him to the hospital and wait for the family member to mm. show up. But if not, he's getting arrested and coming down to the courthouse. Wow. And so I thought, wow, not only did you create us, were we creating this space where people could get help, but now you gave the police officers a, a, a resource, a tool that they could use that allowed them to do the thing that was best for the defendant as a or the, or the suspect or whoever the person, community person was, as opposed to what they customarily did was like, well, he can just go down to the courthouse if he's going to be out here wilding out. As but, I, as what, what, what do you think about this idea of... You know, I, I think of a judge carrying a lot of power. They do. And and I don't know in the hood, they say things like the court is set up where, you know, the judge like God could put you in heaven or hell, you know, mm -hmm. God, they can make all of these decisions about your life, et cetera. Um, when or did you always have it? Did you step into your power as a judge mm -hmm. and know that, mm -hmm. you know what, you can impose your types of value in a mm -hmm. system that's saying we don't do that. Yeah. And then you do it with um, with your training, your yeah. all that you bring to it and discarding some imposter imposter syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> So the judge I clerked for was the first African-American judge um, in Essex County, the second African-American judge in the state of New Jersey. And one, she gave me the best bit of advice, not knowing that I would become a judge. And she said, the worst thing on the bench is a judge who's afraid. Hmm. And she, I said, what is, why is that? She said, because they won't do the right thing even when they're supposed to. And I thought about it. They'd be afraid to dismiss a case, even though the facts said to dismiss the case, because what would people say? And so I got on the bench and said, I'm going to bless as many people as I can. And that meant the victims, their families, it meant everybody who we were supposed to serve was going to get justice. I was just committed mm. to it. And um, I was appointed by now Senator Booker, then Mayor Cory Booker. And I said, you know, he's going to probably be like, why is she not collecting all this money from these folks and send me home? Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's fine, because I got skills to pay my bills. And when you know that you got something else to do, like I didn't get on the bench like, oh, I have to retire from here. So I have to behave a particular way and not ensure that people got justice. And instead, the opposite happened. You know, I was rewarded by another term. And then Mayor Raz Baraka become, mm -hmm. he becomes the mayor. He goes from being a councilman to the mayor. And he then makes me the chief judge because the type of justice that was being practiced in my court was what he believed in and what he wanted the entire court to um, embrace. So I say that I, I went, what, whatever God puts me, I'm mm -hmm. going to do that work. So if God had called me to the hot dog stand in front of the courthouse, I would be doing the same work. I would be talking to people about how they can improve their lives. So when you talk about the judge's power for heaven and hell, what would happen if you use that power for relevance? And for good. 
but for good, transforming people, getting, helping people to transform their lives. And I would yell at young guys, I'm the smartest person you know. So if I say something good about you, you believe that. Mm -hmm. Not the dumb stuff you're hearing on the streets. But a lot of folks are like, um, are like I said, I'm looking at you always with this sense of pride. Oh, you know what I mean? Cool. Because it's great to see that there are individuals, and they are here because in our community they're full. I won't say those that are practicing right now, but I do know, you know, we've had like legends like Judge Gary Jackson, mm -hmm. uh, Judge Claudia Jordan. Jordan. Um, I mean, they're 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 just so many. Um, we were talking about Cleo Parker Robinson's dance theater that was founded by judge raymond jones like you think like there's this rich history of it's like servant leadership yeah it's not about abusing it's not about saying look i made it i got mine you got yours but we in our community have all of these individuals that are like you know beacons of you know and even if we got a question or whatever we know where to go yeah and that's what I like about the fact that you're not disconnected from, mm -hmm. but you're you're a part of. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you ever get lost in that? <laughs> Does it ever cost I mean, you? It, I think it always costs us. I mean, there's so much work to be done. And when I was at the judges meeting last week, the statewide judges meeting, Brian Stevenson spoke the night before and he was amazing. But I almost wanted to leave because I was like, wow, I'm sitting here. I know I have to speak tomorrow, but there's so much work to be done. Like, God, there's so much more work to hmm. be done. I only have one lifetime to get it done in. And, and it, was that going to be enough? You know, and so, yeah, it, there's a cost to it. But for me, the cost is greater. The cost is greater to not hmm. be responsive to the calling on my life. What would you tell a young clerk or like someone that's just getting there, they're just, oh, they're working their way through. Oftentimes they're the first. Yeah. So they don't have that tradition to lean on to talk to their, you know, such and such and such. What would you, what advice would you give those that are just coming into oh, your profession? I would tell a serve, do what's right all the time and stay focused on the goal no matter what's happening around you stay focused we that you know we, we get distracted by we think everything is supposed to go in a straight line and that's not life life is the obstacle life is the setback life is the correction no go this way go that way and so sometimes we think oh i didn't get that so Maybe I should stop. No, it's not stop. It's get back on the right path. Mm -hmm. It's about using those experiences. I know that nothing in your life is wasted. There is no experience that you have. I was on the bench and sometimes somebody would come before me and I'm like, oh my God, I know exactly how to deal with them because of this crazy person that drove me crazy in my life. Mm -hmm. Like it was the same person and I had the language for them. I knew where they were coming for them. I knew what questions to ask because of even some of the bad things that had happened in my mm -hmm. life. And I was like, oh, that's what this was for. And so even when you're afraid, you have to show up and do it anyway. What's life like as a judge? Like most of us know what it's like being in front of a judge. But like, what's your life like? Because it seemed like y'all read too much. <laughs> I can't imagine all that reading. Like, well, man, every time I'm like, y'all yeah, be like, sub chat, and then you be read. I'm like, and then what, can, can I offer a change also? Tell me. I tell can me. you tell them we don't need the little person doing the steno thing anymore? Just push play and record it I, I and put it on a hard are, drive. I think most people are doing the record. You still have a steno? I said, well, I might have been going to some old courts then. We might you not have caught be. up because I still be seeing folks Brother like, Jeff, you might be old. Slow down. I'm thinking like, <laughs> I'm like, just hit record. There's mics you, now. You sound like you're watching Perry Mason. I think so. I don't. <laughs> Judges in Denver, if you're in, do y'all still have these people in front of you? That's old. Thank you. No, we don't have to advocate on that anymore. <laughs> But do you read too much? Like, no. do you get to go home? Like, I can't imagine a case and you got to go through this well, and, and so like, oh, uh, too talk much. The judges about is self care because there's stuff called secondary traumatic syndrome, hmm. and and you are listening and experiencing the trauma of what you're hearing, and every case, like, imagine a stack of cases like that. You're a criminal court judge, and that's twenty cases. You got to get through them before lunch, right? 
every file you open up is somebody has experienced something and the person that's coming before you has experienced some trauma. And so you got to get through your case, but you also have to experience what that person, so you're hearing it. And so that's what that's about, this vicarious trauma that you experience from hearing it. Then you go to the next case, and maybe it's a domestic violence case, and you're looking at this person and you're like, I want to do what's best for the victim. I want to be fair to the defendant, but I'm worried that he might or she might go and hurt this person. And then you're like, I know that there's a great chance that she might be waiting for him downstairs. Hmm. That's one case. Now you go to the next file. You understand? And so. How do they take care of themselves? Well, that's, that's, you know, that's a good question. That's See, real, and, and there's not enough space for that, I think, for judges either. Like this idea that you're just going to have to be, you're just going to have to go through it. You're going to have to just keep doing this. And we got these cases, we got to move. And so in the midst of all this, now we're also telling you, you got to care about people. Um. But you, you, you judges have to be able to also engage in self-care, exercise, and eat. Eat. I tell judges, listen, there's this thing called um, judicial decision fatigue. And they did a study. <laughs> it's not funny, but it is funny because you think about on a regular day being hungry. But then you're on the bench and there's people in the audience and you got to get them out of there. And then you start getting hungry. And so they did this study of these Israeli judges, and they found that the closer you got to lunchtime, when the judge was now experiencing hunger and just fatigue from making decisions over and over again, the harsher the sentences got. So you were like, let me get to court early. <laughs> I want to get that 8 a.m. court. Right. But, you know, we, we have to judges also, you know, it's like when you look at doctors who work those 24 hour shifts. Why do we do that? I don't want a doctor who's on hour 22 working on me. Like, why do we push professionals to their, to, to, to as far as they can go and then ask them and, and want them to be fresh all the time? Judge, I got a recommendation then since, and, 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 and I can just tell you, it's better than the steno because that's my stereotypical mm -hmm. thinking. And it's, that's why you got to have them bias trainings. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like, it's just with me, but I have a, I have a, I have a recommendation. I think you could help me, me with it. Okay, we have a retired sheriff here. Mm -hmm. All right, and the you mean in the room in the room. Oh, in the room. See, we you never knows around. Yes. You know what I mean? And like we got judges, sheriffs, and you know pickpockets in here. Um, I'm not afraid of anything. exactly. <laughs> um, here's my idea. I want to run tell this by tell you. Tell me the idea. If you go to the 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 city jail. 80% of that jail right now is probably filled with mental illness. Yes, because our jails are a new asylum. That is the number one place where where we house mental illness. Yes. So that would tell me that, okay, now let's just say 20% is criminal, right? You know what I mean? Something that's really not mental illness related. Maybe. Okay. Why don't we turn the city jail into a mental health facility and then just let you deal with the part that's criminal? Huh? Well, <laughs> like if about, it's a mint, like about, if it's like the mental mint, like you're getting a lot of trials that, that are like people sleeping outside. Well, there's a bottle. There's somebody who didn't show yes, back up. Yes. And you're seeing that every day. And you're like, OK, I, I need to get over here to this thing that's really damaging to the community. Yes. You know, why can't we just flip this thing? So I have a counter proposal, which I think is better than that. How about we stop criminalizing mental illness? Exactly. So we don't have to have them at the jail. We have them at facilities that take care of mental illness so that we are not punishing. I mean, you know how a law and a, a city ordinance gets written. Somebody sees something is like, I'm tired of seeing these homeless people in the city park. Hmm. I'm going to go back to my office and make an ordinance and make it illegal for the person to be in the city park. What you should be doing is making all those developers that you give tax abatements to mm. that have created the homelessness situation in your city, making them give you money so you can house the people who get displaced. Right. So that's a better. And also, let's um, stop crossing out the um, budget line that provides mental health treatment and housing to the mentally ill, because that's what happens. Right. Somebody goes, mm, I'm going to take this, cut this out the budget. 
And then all of a sudden, all of those people are living in your streets. So, Once we criminalize everything, then it then it comes into the system and eventually you have to see it. Yeah, don't send them to judges. Don't send I'm saying don't send them exactly. to your jail. Send them to spaces that they need to be, which is the healthcare facility. One more question I want to ask you, and then I want you to look into your book, like something in that book that really moves you. You know, it's probably the whole thing, but I'm just saying there's that part in there that's like, this is this is the, I want to share this. And I know that you got to get going because you, you got a plane to catch. So we yes, will wrap yes. it up in just a second. But I want to ask when you hear this thought or this reality to me, but some they say it's not a reality, school or community to prison pipeline. Yes. Um, as a judge, are, do you see that? You know what I mean? That oh, pipeline. And, yes. and, and if so, what recommendations would you give to those um, who are attempting to counter it, knowing that you talked about over, mm -hmm. you know, the punishment factor, yes. but there's also a profit motive attached to to this yes. criminal justice system as well. So there are a number of things and I talk a lot about it in the book without forgetting the sexual assault to prison pipeline as well that our girls suffer from, right? Mm. Because we criminalize victims of sexual assault. So young women end up in detention centers because they're engaged in activities that they do to protect themselves from sexual assault. So they fight, you fight, you know, you run away from home, you run away from home, you might end up in a facility, you are truant, you don't go to school because of this sexual assault and you end up hmm. in so creating off ramps for our young people and that can be done through and in the book I talk about in chapter six about the um, station house adjustments and giving police the opportunity to, in, in New Jersey, station, ha station house adjustments are when a young person gets involved in, um, gets arrested or gets detained by the police, the officer has the opportunity to say, I'm not gonna process you through the criminal justice system. I'm gonna send you to a nonprofit in the community. In Newark, we have a Newark Youth Court. And so we send them to this restorative justice program and they have a case heard by a jury of their peers, which are high school students that we have trained to hear these cases. And then they do community service and get workshops, but we use positive peer pressure, which is having those kids who are doing positive things in the community to do community service mm. with them. And so you're using the things that you have. And this idea, when I was in high school, the principal could discipline you. Mm -hmm. We now have these zero tolerance policies that take disciplinary action away from the principal and now puts it and demands that it's in the hands of the police officer, mm -hmm. right? Which leads I, to that cycle, that pipeline. Yes, and so <clears throat> things that the, the the principal could take care of, now he, he or she can't. And there, this idea of bringing all these police, I said, you know, we have, our schools have more, in most of our schools that have police officers, they have more police officers than they have guidance counselors in the school. Hmm. And so what are we telling kids we think about their future? It, we're more concerned with policing your body than preparing you for a future. I'm not saying, I understand why we have police in school. Mm -hmm. I understand that. But if you got four police in school, and, and no counselors a, and one counselor for a thousand kids what how is that balance but as a judge judge pratt <laughs> <laughs> you sent some people to some journaling oh essays oh yeah essays oh yeah i love this idea could you share like this introspective yeah, this piece around man okay here's what you're gonna you about to go home and write and write and read Black men disappearing from society. I want you to read that and write a reaction to it. Yeah, I want you to read uh, Misguided Justice, The War mm. on Drugs and mm. the African-American Woman, where every chapter starts with um, a woman, an African-American woman and her relationship with a man and how she ends up in federal prison. Wow. Um, I want you to write an essay about where I see myself in the next five years if if I knew then what I know now, how would my life be different? All of that is about the answers. And I think that the answers that we seek are always inside of us. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? Um, 
doing this work, speaking more broadly um, through Impact Odyssey, because we are, this is a new platform for me to address, you know, gender inequality, race, uh, racial discrimination, mass incarceration, religious intolerance. We screen movies and documentaries and we bring faith voices and secular voices together. It's important to me that the faith voices come out and talk about what faith tells us to do about injustice because what faith tells us to do is to act. And so we run these social impact actions so to get people out of jail, to raise awareness so that people of faith and secular folks are in a position to join you mm. with your activism. So um, I'm really in training faith imams, training rabbis to go into the community and to preach to their um, congregations about what we should be doing about ending mass incarceration. How so, big of a deal is Ryan in, in North? Because Ryan was a big well, deal and you guys no, got him from, Ryan, you got him from Manuel and you got him out of our hood and like, like man, yeah. and then he's over there in North. No. How big is Ryan? Because he's doing some incredible so stuff. So I can talk to you. Ryan is not a just a big deal in Newark. He's a huge deal in New Jersey. I can talk to you about the Center for um, the Institute for Social Justice pre Ryan, Ryan and post Ryan. Ryan's efforts, he led a grassroots efforts that got our juvenile facilities that are very far in New Jersey shut down. Wow. And now having this conversation, of, and now they're going to be in smaller, newer facilities. They were in facilities that um, were former military facilities at the turn of the century. And families just couldn't get there because they were so deeply placed in New Jersey that family, poor families couldn't get there to see their families. Um, doing research about the, the wealth gap in New Jersey, doing research about how black children are disproportionately sentenced or in our juvenile justice system when there are more white children who we know commit the same offenses. Mm. And so um, holding, sometimes I laugh, I'm like, Ryan, they're gonna run you out of state. <laughs> Because he had a rally against the governor, 95, 94% black people. The governor said 94% of black people elected me. And Ryan said, okay, so now we're going to have a rally with the 94% to see and make sure that you do what that 94%. Wow. And he does not let up. I just laugh. I'm like, there you go. He does not let up. He pushes and he keeps people organized and <laughs> on task. So we have really been blessed to have Ryan. You're not getting him back. I know, but I'm but but try. we're blessed to have you now. We're trading. <laughs> it's like we're trading. Like you've been here three times. The next time you come, we're gonna have you here. We're gonna have that house ready Excellent. for you. Um, <laughs> fi but finally, share something with you out your out your book on on the I way out and that, tell everybody um, about that incredible so book. My book is called The Power of. Of dignity um it, it it is my this it was a labor of love but it talks about healing our communities i can't tell you what my favorite chapter is but i will tell you that senator cory booker wrote a forward in there a forward in there but i talk about poverty i talk about um things that we can do to transform the entire criminal justice system. But I will say one of probably my favorite is the conclusion is a letter to my son, Hendrick. Mm -hmm. And I talk about why I do this work, why I am in here trying to leave the world a better place so he can live a full life. So he can, so he is not, because right now, I'm worried that he is going to experience what his grandfather experienced, and that shouldn't be. Mm that he shouldn't he shouldn't have to live afraid and he shouldn't have to be subject to racial terror mm -hmm. as a result of us not doing what we were, what we were supposed to do you, you know what's real interesting about black professionals mm -hmm. and that that have made it to all different levels in society and we think about the criminal justice system and because it's dominated with a lot of black bodies, those professionals, it's their brothers, mm -hmm. their fathers, yes. their nephews, their nieces yes. that are on the opposite side mm -hmm. experiencing um, this system from the opposite of how you're experiencing it. And isn't that another reason why we've got to bridge some of these gaps? Because mm -hmm. all of our families are somehow intertwined in, um, in this society. We're not just isolated away wow. from. Yeah, so Rabbi Prince, and I'm going to end with this, Rabbi Prince, um, J Rabbi Jacob Prince spoke at the March on Washington, but Dr. King had a dream, so people forgot. And he said, um, neighbor is more than just a geographical location. It's a moral obligation. Mm. 
And so we serve. So I believe we have a moral obligation, but we also have a professional obligation. We serve not because people are nice, pretty, or uncomplicated, but we serve them because they are our neighbors and we can only live as well as they live. They can't be suffering and we're just living high off the horse. Mm. Their lives impact us because we are connected to them. Wow. Well, with that being said, there she is, uh, Judge Victoria Pratt. Thank you. I got to show them this book because folks are saying, what's the name of that book? Say it again and everything. The Power of Dignity. The Power of Dignity, How Transforming Justice Can Can Heal Our Communities. The Power of Dignity, How Transforming Available Justice. Available any place books are sold. I like it. Did you ever think you'd be saying that? No. Amazon, <laughs> any place books are sold. We um, Your book, your um, bookstore here, T. Tatter Cover. Hmm? Tatter Cover. That? Tea, tea leaves. leaves. I'm sorry. They're both black owned, by the okay, way. Okay. Tea Leaves um, sold books today at my book um at my book signing at the courthouse. So she should have some as well if you want to um, support a black your, business. Your, your final words for all judges everywhere. Oh, boy. This feels like a, um, <laughs> like each question gets harder. We can do better. We mm. can do better. And we will. And we will. Because you're doing this work for real. <laughs> all right, y'all. Let's give our judge a wonderful round of applause. Travel safe. Um, so everyone is just excited by what they're hearing, and I'm just awesome. excited that we've got another sister in the house and uh, just keep doing the work, changing the world, and we're all going to do a little bit together. Don't forget, if you go down, go down swinging, you just might score a knockout. Rumble, young man, women in community, rumble. There you go. Thank you. <laughs>